In this video, we walk through an experimental rule set we have developed for how to use Magic the Gathering cards for running a solo role-playing game. Go ahead, dig out those stacks of unused Magic cards, and follow along as we outline the structure for a solo role-playing adventure. Hello gamers, Matthew here from Grey Army Gaming in lovely Furloon, Sweden. This is going to be a bit of a different video today, but it all revolves around this, Magic the Gathering. Now a few years ago, I bought a ton of these cards in bulk from eBay for a really cheap price because I was working with youth and I was trying to help them get away from their screens and play some games with each other. And so I bought a bunch of these really uh, cheap cards, commons and uncommons, to make a bunch of just uh, throwaway decks that we could use to learn how to play Magic and to meet one another and play games together. Now I've had a lot of these cards sitting around for a couple of years since I first made these decks for these kids and the question has now come up, what can we possibly do with these cards? And I thought to myself recently, why not turn it into a solo role playing game? What you see before you is the setup that I'm going to be using when I play this role-playing game, but you really don't need to have figurines or terrain or anything else. All you need for this game is just a bunch of magic cards. It's as simple as that. Of course, having some paper and a pen to make notes would really help out, but you really can play this game just by using the magic cards. In order to clarify my ideas and try to keep everything orderly and clear, I have gone ahead and made a PDF document called Playing a Solo Role-Playing Game with Magic the Gathering, uh, in which I walk through the, uh, the different rules I'll be using in this game. This is uh, a free PDF that you can download in the link below if you want to follow along as we walk through this rule set. For the rule set, I've split it into four parts. We have the setup, we have gameplay, examples of game mechanics, and then finally additional notes. Now for this run through, I'm mostly gonna focus on the first two of those, the setup, which you see here in blue, and then the actual gameplay in green. So let's go ahead and start by uh, walking you through the setup for this role-playing game. The very first thing we want to do in the setup, and the most important thing for this game, is to go ahead and split out your cards between your lands and the rest of your cards. Now, I have about 50 land cards here with a bunch of specialty cards, uh, but there's a lot of just regular old mana cards. So we have, you know, some forests, plains. Um, if you have some really cool things like Subterranean Hangar, for example, that's a, a really interesting card. Um, here's a card that's an instant, but I like the picture. It looked kind of like a cool land, early frost. Um, if you have cards like that, like Ravaged Highlands, for example, those can give some really cool flavor. These are going to be our setting cards, so set those aside over here to the side. The rest of the cards you're going to use are just your general magic cards, your commons and your uncommons. For the regular pile of cards, it really doesn't matter what kind of cards they are. They can be creature cards, artifacts, they can be sorcery, instants, interrupts, it really does not make any difference whatsoever. The most important thing for this game is to try to pick out cards that have really interesting pictures because that is what we're going to be using for the narrative element here. So we have this cool salt road patrol, we got this really cool picture here of a guy uh, chasing down this carriage, uh, we've got some really exciting action uh, pictures going on here. Um, Dreadwaters, this is cool, look at the water coming into this graveyard, you could use that uh, for a land as well. Uh, so try to pick out just a bunch of really cool cards with really cool pictures that could contribute easily to the story of the role playing game. Now one other thing we should also note is that uncommons and commons are really nice because generally they have a pretty low casting cost and that's really going to help us out later on in some of the game mechanics which we'll explain in a little bit. So grab a whole bunch of cards, I typically when I play this game I have something like 50 lands over here and over here I have maybe I don't know anywhere from three to four hundred commons and uncommons. The next step now is our character selection. What we need to do is select a character by picking a race, a class, and a background. Let's keep things simple here. I'm just gonna have a human and we're gonna have a human cleric who has the sage background. And if you're going to be using a mini like I'm using in this setup, uh, you can go ahead and pick out a corresponding mini. This guy should work just fine. We'll throw him over here on the chair. 
The next step now is to choose the character level, the bonus level and hit points and draw for gold pieces. So I'm gonna uh, look over at the chart here for character specifics and I'm gonna use an intermediate level for my character. So not a beginner, but not an expert either. So we'll go intermediate. And with the intermediate character here, you see that there is a plus two bonus and 20 hit points total to start with and we have a total of two cards of gold pieces. So let's go ahead and draw for the starting number of gold pieces. To determine the number of gold pieces for our intermediate character, we will draw two cards and look at the total mana cost, and that will be the number of gold pieces we have. So we take these two cards, flip them over, and we see here the first card uh, is a, a total of three mana. So two colorless and one green. And the other one is also a total of three. We have two colorless and one white. So that would be a total of six. We would say our character now has six gold pieces to start off the game. So let's go ahead and write that in our notes here. Six gold pieces. The next step in this process now is to get a character name. And I really like this part of the game. It is really exciting to see what kind of names you come up with. What we're going to do now is draw cards and combine the first syllables or letters of each card in a logical manner to arrive at a name. And we can draw as many or as few cards as we need. So here we go. This is really exciting. Let's start drawing our cards and see what kind of name we can come up with. So here we see I'm going to combine the first three cards and take Devo from the first card, Te, and then S from the third card. So we have the name Devotes. And we can go ahead and add that to our notes. Devotes. Unused cards can just get thrown into a discard pile. If you need more cards when you're playing, if you run out of cards to draw from, you can just reshuffle these cards back into your draw pile. With our character now decided, let's go ahead and find a setting, a starting setting for our campaign or our session. And the way we're going to do this is go back to our land cards here, shuffle them up, and I'm going to draw the top land card. And let's see what we get here. Okay, it is a mountain card, uh, and it's a generic mountain card, but it's a really cool picture. You can see there's some bridges and some uh, little huts, it looks like, paths going through the mountains. Perfect, so this will be our starting setting. We can go ahead and set this down over here so we know that that is our starting setting. Now, if we want to, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you want to have a name of this place, you can do the exact same process as for picking a character name. So let's go ahead and see if we can come up with a cool name using the cards uh, to give us some syllables and letters. All right, and I picked uh, only two cards for the name of this mountain, and it's a really cool name, Ruinov will be the name of this mountain village starting place for our scenario. So Ruinov is the name of where our character finds himself. And you can see here now I've added that to our notes here, the Ruinov Mountains. And it's really important to keep in mind that with the land and the settings, you can be really flexible here. This is just the starting setting for our campaign. And as we said, as you move and progress through the narrative, maybe you move to a city or you have a very clear beat in the narrative that takes you in a different direction. Well, feel free to leave the mountains and go somewhere else. You don't need to draw another land card. But let's say you, uh, you're you looking for a random place. You want to go somewhere randomly. You don't quite know. Well, you can pick another card and add that to your list. Uh, in this case, we have Blighted Gorge. So maybe our character leaves the mountains and comes across this gorge where something happens. So you can always use the land cards as prompts to push the narrative forward, but you don't need to be stuck to them. And the final part of the setup now is to find the quest and the goal for this session or for this campaign. And what we're going to do now is draw five cards randomly from our pile of cards here, lay them out, and pick one card that seems uh, most logical or most interesting for us.
So these are some really great cards, and there are so many possibilities here. Uh, let's just show some of the ideas you could have with this. Perhaps if you choose this one, uh, you need to find this artifact, this arcane spyglass, and it has been hidden or lost somewhere, and you, your, your mission is to find it and to deliver it to maybe to the king of, uh, of this town. Maybe here you see in this picture, um, maybe there is a bunch of pests or rodents or creatures that are bothering a town. You somehow need to get them out of the town, eradicate the town of these pests using magical means, perhaps even music. Uh, maybe here there is an octopus that has been uh, destroying ships in a harbor in a local village, and your job is to find out how to get rid of the octopus. Or maybe here there is a wizard who has been sending bolts down and destroying uh, parts of this, uh, this country, and your job is to go and confront the wizard in order to stop the damage. Over here we have a, uh, looks like a, a giant who has been sleeping or has been put to sleep or woken up, maybe your task is going to go ahead and try to wake him up or put him to sleep. There are so many different options here using these pictures, um, and I would say, I mean, let's just take this one for example. Maybe I'll use this one and make this the game, um, the game's aim or uh, goal, and uh, I'm going to interpret it in this way. Uh, there is a, a task that I need to go and wake up this giant. It's actually a really kind giant who is the protector of a village. And a wizard has put the giant to, to sleep and has now been terrorizing the people. So our task in this mission is to go and wake up this giant in order to help save the people from this wizard. So with that decided, we can take our goal mission card and put it here at the bottom. Take the rest of the cards, throw them in the discard pile. And if you want, then you can go ahead and get your notes and make a little a note about what it is that you've decided the mission or aim of this session to be. So our aim now is to, uh, let's say, uh, wake up the giant. And with everything in this game, if you want to give the giant a name or you want to give this wizard or mage a name, just go ahead and draw some more cards. Throw the syllables and letters together and come up with a creative name. And here's what I've come up with for a name for the giant. We're going to take uh, this syllable. We'll go Flynn and we'll go Far. So Flynnfar, Flynnfar, however you want to pronounce that. That will be the name of our giant, Flynnfar. All right, we have a character, we have a name, we have a setting, we have a goal or aim of the mission. With that, the setup is pretty much complete, and now we can go ahead and move over to the gameplay. The most important game mechanic for playing this solo RPG game is what I'm calling narrative beats. Now, you may have as many narrative beats as you need in the game. Uh, typically, I try to shoot for about seven. That's about the right amount to have a full session or a full one shot. Now, in order to do this, what you're going to do is draw five random cards and select one card for the first narrative beat. And you want to pick out a card of the picture that looks the best or seems like it has the most promise for helping you start out your narrative or keep your narrative going. So let's go ahead and draw five cards and see what kind of pictures we get. All right, let's take a look at this. Here are the five cards that we have. Uh, once again, primarily focusing on the pictures here for the narrative, ele narrative element. Uh, cool staircase, something of a ghost walking up. Uh, we have some soldiers, it looks like, walking through some wasteland. Uh, there is a guy who is uh, trying to control some sort of essence. Um, we have a, looks like a sorcerer of sorts and a pendant hanging on a chain. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually pull out this one, throw the rest of the cards in the discard pile. Uh, I really like this picture. This will be the first narrative beat for our story. Our character finds himself in the mountainous area, uh, the mountainous region of uh, Ruinov, uh, and Devotis is in his house when he is suddenly met by a ghost-like figure who comes and says something to him. So we're going to go ahead and lay this down on the table as our first narrative beat. Here's where you can let your imagination run wild. Devotees is sitting in his great hall, uh, his castle uh, in, in the Ruinov Mountains, when suddenly he is met by a spirit uh, that comes with a certain message to him. And now you can develop this as much as you want. Remember, our goal is to try and find um, the, the mage or the sleeping giant and wake him up. So maybe uh, maybe the spirit could be some, uh, someone who has been killed in this village who is calling and asking him for help so that the first narrative 
narrative beat is really going to get us into the story. Uh, and you can play with it, take it in any direction you want. Maybe the spirit has a name. In that case, draw some cards, throw the letters together and make a name uh, and work with that until you feel like you've come to the conclusion of that narrative beat and you need uh, the next part of the story. If you're using a setup like mine, you might want to just move your character, your figurine um, next to the picture and keep doing that as you progress through the narrative. When you feel like you've resolved that narrative, well, time to get a second narrative beat. Draw five more cards and pick out the one that seems best and most logical. Okay, here's our next five cards. You can look at these pictures once again to pick out something great. Oh, cool. A wolf. Uh, a bird, wow, there could be lots of cool interactions with nature. Um, there's a wanderer and some sort of uh, destruction of an artifact. Okay, well, let's just say this. Let's continue on and say that our character, he sets off on his quest, and uh, while he is walking through the, the woods, the forest around his area, he runs into uh, an elf druid, an, an NPC who he meets and begins to talk with, and who is now going to join him on his quest. We can move our character down here to this picture and now run with this story. What is this uh, elf druid doing out there? What is it a friendly creature? Is it someone who is going to be mean to him? Do they ha have some way to help him? Uh, something to contribute to this? Maybe they know something about this mage and they can help him out in this story. Run with it. Be creative. Use your imagination. Come up with a really cool uh, story that, that really uh, contributes to the overall narrative and the goal that you're heading towards. And run with that as long as you want and keep on going in this fashion until you uh, feel like you've had enough narrative beats or until you come to the goal itself. And once again, this is all just random, dictated by the cards you draw and the one that you pull out of the five cards. But you can see here the narrative progression in our story. We started out with visit of this ghost. We meet this druid. Uh, something happens. Perhaps she gets possessed or taken over. Maybe he has to fight her. There is a, a, an artifact that they come across that gives them a clue. Eventually, they come to the great city. Uh, the banners are flying up. But there is a, a fight with the peasants in the city who are being attacked by uh, some of these uh, goblins who have been sent by the uh, uh, sent by the mage. So the need is really there in order to try to wake up this giant. Uh, I could keep going as long as I want. Remember though, the goal is to get down here. Uh, but as long as as long as the narrative uh, elements here beats keep contributing, I don't have to stop at seven. I can keep going. I could have 10, 15, 20. They can be as long or as short as I want. Maybe I only use two or three of these and that lasts for two hours. Who knows? Feel free to add as many narrative beats as you need uh, or to use as few as you need. Uh, but the point is to, to move the narrative along until you eventually get to your goal, uh, which is the success or the conclusion of the campaign. So once again, the narrative beats are the most important part of the solo role-playing game. That's what's going to help guide the story for you and give you prompts to develop with your own improv improvisational skills the story towards its goal. But let's go ahead and do some of the more crunchier um, game mechanics that are going to help you um, add some random and fun elements into the game. The first one is how to face challenges. Facing challenges is an interesting way to introduce some random elements into your narrative and into your game. Now, a challenge is something that is a little extra difficult um, than your normal activities. So, for example, climbing a steep wall, persuading a politician, sneaking past a guard, picking a lock, performing a song, things where uh, the success or failure has consequences uh, and above and beyond your normal character actions. And the way we're going to deal with this is by drawing cards in order to determine the success or failure of a particular challenge. So let's use a simple example from our narrative thus far. Uh, our hero Devotees uh, in the second narrative beat comes across this druid elf and he wants to try to convince her, persuade her to join him in his task. Now, the first thing we need to do is set the difficulty class of the challenge according to the descriptions below in the chart here. And keep in mind that moderate is the most common of the difficulty classes. Uh, and each of the DCs will have a specific requirement for success. So let's set this and say that th this is a moderate difficulty for this persuasion. So the difficulty class is moderate. And you see from the chart here, this is going to require us uh, drawing three of a kind. And here when I speak of two of a kind, three of a kind, four of a kind, I mean all evens or all odds in the mana costs of the cards. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to draw two cards and compare the mana costs of each of them. If they're both even or they're both odd, this is considered a pair. 
Uh, if the DC of the challenge was set as easy, then, well, this would be considered a success. If one card is even and one is odd, this is considered a failure, unless you use a redraw, which we'll mention in a second. If the DC is set as moderate, you'll need to continue to draw one card at a time until you achieve three of a kind. And you can continue in this fashion for difficult and extreme uh, DCs uh, until you are satisfied, you've achieved it, or uh, until you run out of redraw possibilities. But let's give an example here. Moderate requires three of a kind, so let's start by drawing our first card. You look here, the mana cost on the top is six, so that is an even card. We draw our second one now and compare it. It is a one, so we drew an odd card. This would be considered a failure now because the, the chain has been broken. We don't have a pair, we have an even and we have an odd. So if we have no redraw possibilities, that would be a failure. And then we would have to go back and interpret the narrative accordingly and say that our hero is unable to persuade the druid elf to follow along. She goes off in her own direction, and maybe she comes back in the story later as something of an enemy. Who knows? But so we would call that a failure. Let's just say for the sake of this example, however, that I drew these cards. The first two were, um, were these two cards, one mana cost and one mana cost. So we have odds. That's a pair. So, so far that is a, a success if it were an easy uh, challenge, but we have a moderate challenge, so we need a third one. I draw a third card and I get a total of three mana cost. So that's also odd. So you see here we have three of a kind. We would say that is now a success. Now. There's always an incentive to keep going to see if you can exceed the difficulty class. As long as you have redraw possibilities. I, would, I wouldn't want to draw a card right now if I don't have any redraw possibilities because I could still fail if I draw an even card. Uh, so I want to be careful here. If I don't have any redraw possibilities, maybe I'll say, I'm happy here. It was a moderate success. Uh, I didn't exceed the DC at all. But you know what? That's good enough to be able to convince our druid to follow me, to persuade her to come along with me and be a part of my story. So I might just leave it there. However, if I have a redraw possibility, I may want to keep drawing until I, I see how far I can go. So let's keep on going here. Uh, this is a two. Oh, that's an even. So that would disrupt the chain unless I have a redraw possibility. I can throw that card out and uh, maybe I'll stay there now because if I draw another even, I would destroy this and I would fail. But maybe I want to risk it because maybe I really want to persuade her even more than the normal amount. Well, let's just try it anyway and see what happens. Let's pull this card up. Uh, here is another three. Okay, so I have four cards, four of a kind, which exceeds the three of the kind requirement for the, uh, for the moderate uh, difficulty class. So we say this, um, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to keep on drawing, but because we exceeded it, we can say this, that not only do we persuade our druid to come along, but she uh, is extremely helpful in leading us somewhere where she has a whole elven uh, squad that is going to follow us in the trees and uh, jump out if necessary to fight on our behalf. So you can see how you can interpret the narrative in different ways depending on how strongly you meet the DC or exceed it. So that's a good example of, of how to use the DC card uh, mechanic when you're looking for a, a moderate challenge. So once again, it's always in your best interest to try to succeed at challenges to the highest level because that really contributes to the story and the narrative. So for example, let me give you an another example from the rules sheet. If the DC for performing a song is moderate and the player achieves extreme, so five of a kind instead of three of a kind, not only does the player succeed in the performance, but he or she does so to an extreme degree such that those listening are moved to tears and perhaps are willing to do anything for this, this performer. So there's always a narrative incentive to try to achieve the highest level of success in a challenge. And once again, there's always grace, what I'm calling redraws in this challenge uh, dynamic. And if you look at the chart here, you can see depending upon your character level, in each challenge you may draw a new card if the card drawn results in a failure. So the number of allowed redraws uh, according to each character level is as follows. A beginner will get one redraw per challenge. Intermediate will get two. Advanced will get two. Expert will get three. And Legend will get three. 
So those are the number of redraws that you can have in each challenge. So when you start a new challenge, you get to start over with one or two or three redraws. And the purpose of this is as you get better and better from beginner to legend, you should be better at these skills. So the DC, uh, if, if it's, even if it's really difficult, uh, you should have a better chance as a legendary character of achieving that than you would as a beginner. The next mechanic has to do with combat. And by combat, I mean there are certain elements involved. We have initiative, we have attacking, defending, and then we have dealing damage. And all of these are used, uh, are played out through use of the different mana costs on the cards that you draw. So let's say that our hero makes his way down here and gets into a combat with a couple of the villagers who are rioting. And now we need to come into a, a combat scene. Well, how are we gonna do this? Let's start out by drawing for initiative. And the way we do this is that you, for your character, draw three cards and add up the mana cost of the cards, uh, plus your character bonus, and that will be your initiative score. So let's say that these are the cards that I drew for my initiative and really good numbers. We have, uh, we have six, 10, 15, plus my bonus of two because I'm an intermediate character. So that would be a total of 17 for my initiative score, a really good score. Once we've done that, we will go back to our draw pile now and draw out the initiative score for our enemies. If we have a bunch of them, say a bunch of, uh, of commoners, we'll just give them the same initiative. Uh, if you have special characters, well, maybe they get their own initiative. But try to keep the initiatives um, as few as possible. We'll do the same thing here. We'll draw three cards, add it up, and add their bonus. They're commoners, so we'll say they're beginners. Uh, they get a plus one then. And here for the commoners, you see we have two... Uh, six, seven, plus their one, eight. So they would have an initiative score of eight. That means that my character would begin the first uh, action in combat. So as you work your way through the combat, it's important to remember the bonus that your character has because we're going to be drawing basically three cards for attacking and defending and adding our bonuses to see if we hit. Damage is a little bit different, but we'll get to that in a second. So let's say I want to run in and attack one of the uh, commoners who is charging into me. I run up to that commoner and I make an attack. So I'll draw three cards, look at the mana total, and then I will add my bonus of plus two. So with these three cards, we see that I got a 2, uh, 5, 6, 10, plus my 2. That would give me a 12. So my attack is a 12. The defense for the commoners now is going to be three cards plus their bonus. And here you see the three cards they got gives them a total of 2, 4, 5, plus their one bonus, 6. So the attack goes through, and I'm ready to deal damage. Damage is very simple. I uh, draw one card, and the amount of damage dealt is the mana cost plus the attacker's bonus. So in my case, plus two. We draw the card up here, and we see here that there's two mana costs plus two. I do four points of damage to the commoner I'm engaged with. If you look at the bottom of the combat section here, you see there is a chart for enemy stats. And it's probably a good idea to actually figure out the enemy stats beforehand before you actually start combat. Uh, I didn't do that in this case, but we can assume that the commoners are weak. So they have a plus one bonus, which I've been giving them, uh, which means they have one to five hit points. And you as, a, as the solo uh, game master can decide if you want to make them extra weak or a little higher on the weak side. Uh, if, in that case, maybe you want to give them five points if they're a little bit higher. Or here's always something fun you can do is you could draw a card, uh, one card for weak characters, uh, two cards for strong, three, or excuse me, two for normal, three cards cards for strong, so on and so forth, to see the hit points for each of those uh, uh, characters that you're fighting with. Uh, in this case, why not? Let's draw a card before we start our combat and see uh, this first guy that we uh, are attacking. And we see here he has a total of four hit points. I did a total of four damage, so that means that that uh, character is killed uh, as he charges into me. There are two more, say. I mean, we've decided there are three uh, commoners that have been charging in. So there are two more commoners who are still alive. And now with their initiative order, they will get an opportunity to attack. 
We follow the same order. They take three cards, add their bonus of plus one, compare that to my three cards plus my bonus of plus two. If they miss, then we just continue on and I can take a new action if I want to leave the combat or uh, attack back, so on and so forth. Uh, and we keep on going in that fashion until um, we're satisfied with the combat and the narrative associated with it. And just a quick note about combats. In this rule system, combats can prove quite deadly. So it is often in the best interest of you as the character to avoid them if possible. Uh, moreover, fleeing from a combat is always a viable option uh, if hit points become low. So any lost hit points can be regained uh, from a long rest if you're able to get away. And I've included some rules here for how to look at uh, regaining hit points. So for example, on a long rest, three cards, mana cost of healing per long rest. Uh, from consuming a healing potion, for example, there might be different values. A lesser healing might be one card uh, mana cost worth of healing. Uh, a greater healing might be two cards, so maybe three plus three. Or from healing spells, if you have spells um, associated with their characters or other NPCs you meet, one card mana cost per bonus level. So, for example, a legendary cleric would provide five cards of mana cost of healing with a healing spell. The next really important and fun game mechanic is the oracle mechanic. And this is where you ask yes or no questions to the oracle, to the skies, to NPCs, anything you want. You ask a yes or no question to try and help forward the narrative. So let's say in this example, uh, we are walking with our druid and we come across another woman, a priestess who is in a state of ecstasy. And the question is, I walk up to her, the question is, does she know where we can find this wizard that we are looking for? And it's a yes or a no question. So how do we work this out? Well, we've got a really cool mechanic for this. The oracle mechanic is really simple and really fun. All you need to do now after you've asked your yes or no question is to draw two cards and add up the total mana cost from both. And what you need to do then is compare the sum to the following chart that we provide here and interpret the results. From the chart, you can see that their even numbers will always lead to some form of yes, and odd sums will always lead to some form of no. And there are weaker yeses and stronger yeses, weaker noes and stronger noes. So let's give you an example by drawing two cards. Take these two cards, and let's compare the sum here we have two plus two that is an even number so it is a four if we look at our chart now we will see that four is a yes so it's not a weak yes it's not a strong yes but it's still a yes so the answer would be that yes this priestess does indeed know where we can find the mage were we to have drawn two cards, say two ones, which would give us a total of two, it would be a weak yes. And maybe we interpret that in the fashion of saying she has a general idea of the area in which the mage is, but she's not really sure. Or maybe a, a six as a sum would be a strong yes. Not only does she know where he is, but she, she can uh, give us directions, the best and safest way to get to his lair. And maybe if we had an extreme yes, like an 8, 10, 12, 14, not only does she know, but she will personally take us there. So you can see how stronger and weaker answers can help us interpret the narrative in interesting and fun ways. What I like about this method is that it leans in favor of positive answers. And positive answers can be really fun for helping push forward the narrative. So does she know where the mage is? Yes, that obviously helps the narrative in a really exciting way. Uh, does this person have any relation to me? Uh, blood relation? Yes. Oh, interesting. Well, let's follow that up. Um, does the mage intend on attacking me as soon as I enter the, the, the castle? Yes. Okay, well, let's figure out that and see what happens. Uh, and you can see this, the, the mechanics set up in this way because two even numbers, when you add them together, will always give you an even. So two plus two will give you four, for example. And two odds will also give you an even. So three plus three will give you six. The only way to get an odd is by drawing an even card and an odd card. Um, so that's important to keep in mind that, that this leans toward positive yes answers. Now, positive answers can help move the narrative away along in interesting ways, but negative answers can also be interpreted in ways that are quite interesting for the story. And there you just need to be creative and to try to figure out how that negative answer actually pushes forward the narrative. And the final game mechanic that we are going to be using here is just simply for numbers. 
You can draw one or more cards depending on the need and the question in order to derive a numerical value. So let me give you some sample questions. Maybe you want to know, how much damage do I suffer from the fall? Well, draw a card. Look at the mana costs, and you see here, oh, two damage from that fall. Okay, so my character suffers two damage from falling off of the wall. Other questions might be, how many patrons are seated in the tavern? And maybe I draw two cards for that because it's a big tavern. Uh, how many goblins charge me from the mouth of the cave? Maybe I draw two cards for that. Uh, how many gold pieces do I found in, find in the treasure chest? It's a massive treasure chest, so maybe I draw five cards and add up the, all the mana costs together. Uh, maybe that gives me 15 gold pieces or something. Um, how many years have I, have, have I gone since I spoke with my brother last? Oh, maybe I draw... Uh, three cards there and add up the sum. Oh, it's been 12 years since I talked to my brother last. So any numerical value, uh, use your judgment and draw as many cards as you need and add up the total to give you the numerical value that you're looking for. In order to start to bring this video to a conclusion, let me leave you with two additional points from the additional notes. The first one is that when you're in doubt, apply the rule of cool in your interpretations of cards and results to give you the best possible, the most cool narrative. The whole point of this is to have fun and to walk through your narrative uh, to get to your aim and your goal. And that, that's the whole point of this. So always give yourself some grace and try to interpret things in the coolest and most fun way. And the second point is that this uh, rule set is intended primarily for solo play. Uh, but it could also be used to run a session with multiple characters who serve as both players and collective game master with the mechanics that I've outlined here. So it's possible for you to sit down with a two, three, four friends, pull out a magic deck, and uh, start to play a role-playing game in which you allow the cards and the mechanics to dictate what happens to your characters. Well, there you have it, folks, a brief run through of how to take Magic the Gathering cards and use them to run a solo role playing game. Now, I've play tested this a little bit, and I hope in the future to be able to upload a video in which I actually take you through a full session using this rule set. But my hope also is that some of you out there will be willing to try this out and play test it and see if uh, there are things that work, things that don't work, things that should be changed, um, ways that we can improve this rule set and make it even better. I've uploaded a PDF version of the rule set uh, for free for anybody who wants to download it. Go ahead and check out the description below. Download the rule set and give it a try for yourself. If you appreciate this kind of content, please do give me a thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment below, and I'll be sure to continue to produce these kind of videos in the future. But most of all, thank you for joining us here today at Grey Army Gaming for the future of gaming.